That was something that was talked about a little bit in the, in the, in the videos. Do you remember what the reason is for why an aldehyde carbon would be more electrophilic than a ketone carbon? Well, uh, because oxygen is so electronegative, it, uh, on the formaldehyde, it's really pulling all the electrons, or not all, but a lot of electron density away from the carbon. So it's making it really delta positive, where on a ketone, or where uh, when you have another ketone or a ketone reaction, you're getting a stability, you're getting a spread of that uh, electron density over the whole molecule because of resonance. Okay, that answer, I think uh, that won't quite work. What you were focusing on was this oxygen. Mm -hmm. And the reason that doesn't work is that these both have oxygens. Okay. And you also mentioned resonance. And that won't work because they both have resonance. Okay. They both have the same exact resonance structures. There's a resonance structure where this oxygen is negative and this carbon is positive. But there's also a resonance structure where this oxygen is negative and this carbon is positive. So we can't explain the difference between these with something that occurs on both of these. We have to focus on some way that these are different. Let me just sure. Now you did say something that was very important. You remember that the whole reason why these are electrophilic in the first place is the delta positive charge on this carbon. There is a delta positive charge on this carbon which makes it electrophilic. But this well, delta is positive is any bigger. Are, are the, car uh, the alkyl groups electron donating? That's the key. I had to draw it out. Right. So I could see it. That's the key. So, which of these really has a bigger delta positive, the formaldehyde or the ketone? That's right. Because this delta positive is being slightly canceled out by the electron donating alkyl groups off to the side. This I was is thinking yeah. of like a, 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 a ketone, I was thinking of like a molecule with two ketones attached. This is why I was talking right. resonance and stuff. Right. Yeah, so this is not like a 1,3-dicarbonyl. Yeah. Yeah. You might have been thinking yeah. of a 1,3-dicarbonyl. Right, too much material at yeah. once. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Okay, so here we have, all right, so you correctly saw that the whole reason these are electrophilic is the delta positive, but this delta positive actually is fairly happy because it's being stabilized by the electron donating carbon chains. We've just memorized that alkyl groups' carbon chains are electron donating, and since we have that memorized, they're not very electron donating, but they're more electron donating than hydrogens. Mm -hmm. Crudely speaking, we can say they're more electron donating than hydrogen just because they have way more electrons. Mm -hmm. Here there's an electron cloud, and here there's an electron cloud, but there's no electron clouds just in these hydrogens. So these can stabilize this positive charge. Right. So in general, who's more reactive, aldehydes or ketones? Aldehydes. Because they don't have as many carbon chains. And of course, this is really reactive because a normal aldehyde would at least have one carbon chain. But formaldehyde doesn't have any carbon chain, so this is very reactive. And you can see they did that on purpose to make sure that they would get a pure yield. Mm -hmm. So that solves the problem of our crossed aldol condensation. In order for the crossed aldol condensation to give us a pure yield, we want only one of the molecules to form the enolate. Mm -hmm. And we want only one of the molecules to be the electrophile. Okay. Well, in this case, there's only going to be one that's the enolate, because only one has alpha hydrogens. And only one will be the electrophile because this is much more electrophilic than this ketone. So we don't need to worry that this is going to attack another uh, ketone because this is much more reactive. So your assumptions turned out to be right, and we really are going to attack the formaldehyde over here. But that's a key issue for these crossed aldol condensations. And we got this. And this was the right product because I didn't say there was heat. Now for practice, let's say there was heat. Let's show what happened next. Keep going through the mechanism. Now, you correctly remembered that in order to get another attack, we need to make this into an enolate again. However, I think you combined two steps into one. First, we're going to make the enolate, and then it's going to attack. First, we're going to make the enolate, and then it's going to attack.
first we make the emulate, and only now should we show it attacking. So this arrow here would be wrong, That's because great. instead of these electrons immediately moving down here, they should just go Back onto the alpha carbon. They're just forming a lone pair on the alpha carbon. We're making another enolate. And now I can. And then the purpose of making that enolate is then to show the attack and kicking off the leading group. So it's these second steps that tend to mess people up in the mechanism. First, we deprotonate the alpha carbon, and then it attacks. Okay. Let's confirm that in the handout. So here we are in the middle. Nucleophilic alpha carbon loses the proton. Then the carbonyl oxygen leaves while the nucleophile attacks. Now actually, I, actually I've got to admit, I've actually seen some people draw it the way you drew it. Sometimes I have seen people show this all as one step. But I think this is more logical because it parallels the first part more. In the first part, we form the enolate, and then it attacks mm -hmm. the carbonyl. Well, then it's going to be more similar if we follow the same pattern here. First, form the enolate, and then have it attack the carbonyl. It's really the same exact steps. I think that's something I really want to emphasize. In the first step, the category one step, we form the enolate, and then it attacks the starved carbon. And then under hot conditions, we just do the same things all over again. You deprotonate the alpha carbon, and then it attacks the starved carbon. It's the same exact step. So I think that's the best way to write it. Okay. Remember, what was the general name for this type of product that we got here? Uh, that is um, uh, uh, beta, what's it, beta unsaturated. Or no, beta saturated. Now, unsaturation would pop up here, because this is the double bond. What do we call this functional group? A hydroxy. Oh, beta, yes, beta hydroxy. Beta hydroxy. And in this case, we have a beta hydroxy ketone, because one of the attackers has a ketone. And now, what would be a good name for this compound? An alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone. Here's where we use alpha and beta, because the unsaturation is between two carbons. Again, if you're doing a synthesis problem and you see that you're trying to make a beta hydroxy aldehyde or ketone, you should probably do a category one aldol reaction. Whereas if you're doing a synthesis and you see you're trying to make an alpha beta unsaturated ketone, you should probably do a category three aldol reaction. Something I forgot to mention before. Now we know that we can't protonate this hydroxy before it leaves. Because if we protonated it before it left, it would become positive and that's not consistent with our conditions. But that should still worry us because neutral oxygens are very bad leaving groups. We're sometimes allowed to have a neutral oxygen as a leaving group, but only if there's some driving force. There must be some driving force that's kicking off this oxygen. That was discussed in the other video series. The driving force is forming conjugation. Mm -hmm. That's something that we've discussed. Is conjugation good or bad? Good. Because it allows resonance. Mm -hmm. Now, is this really conjugated? No. Why yes or why not? Is this molecule conjugated? Well, I guess it is conjugated because it has uh, uh, alternating double bonds. Single and double bonds, that's right. The standard definition of conjugation is alternating. It doesn't matter which atom it's connected to, though? It doesn't matter where the conjugation is, yeah. though. It doesn't have to be carbons okay. that are involved. So here we have double, single, double. Okay. Double, single, double, that's enough to get conjugation. Okay. We've also learned, I, I, I told you there was a, a better definition of conjugation, which is side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals. Mm -hmm at three or more atoms. Well, this satisfies that as well, because this is sp2 hybridized, this is sp2 hybridized, this is sp2 hybridized, and this oxygen is also sp2 hybridized. So they all have p orbitals. So we got one, two, three, four overlapping p orbitals. So this also satisfies the more general definition of conjugation. And as you were saying, conjugation is good, because it allows resonance delocalization through, it allows electron de delocalization through resonance. So that was the driving force that permitted us to kick off a neutral oxygen. 
So we have seen some cases now this term where you're allowed to have a neutral oxygen as a leaving group, but there always has to be a reason for it. Or the reason here was to form this conjugation. All right. We don't want to just kick off neutral oxygens willy-nilly.